Today I want to talk with you about the future of religion. I want to share with you some information about the future of religion that we know from social scientific investigation of religion, and I want to invite you to think about your own attitudes toward religion and spirituality and your own interest in the future of religion and spirituality. Thank you. We're surrounded by religion all the time. We encounter it all the time. We encounter it very particularly in the news every day. And what we encounter in the news uh, are stories about religious violence, stories about religious persecution, stories about religious abuse, stories about religious hatred. But we also encounter stories about remarkable forgiveness. We encounter stories about compassion and generosity. We encounter stories about peace and nurturing the next generation. It's hard for us to avoid religion. Stories are all around us. Many of us have been formed in traditions of religion or have been formed without those traditions, sometimes in a neutral way, sometimes in an aggressive way. And so when we think of the topic of religion, we all bring our history, we all bring our own perspectives. What does that mean for us as we think about the future of religion. The definitions of religion, and particularly the definitions of spirituality, are contested, and so it's probably worth spending a minute as we begin to kind of think about, well, what exactly does he mean by religion? What exactly does he mean by spirituality? And so here are some definitions from a respected psychologist of religion, Kenneth Pargament, they're not the only ones, it's a contested area, but I hope that they'll work for us in, in terms of the conversation that we have or you're thinking about this today. So as we think about what the social scientists tell us about the future of religion, I want to begin by thinking about what we learn from social science about the future of religion, religious affiliation, religious self-identification from a global perspective. The data that I'm showing you come from the Pew Research Center from a study that they've done about changes that are expected in religious self-identification around the world uh, between 2010 and 2050. When they looked at uh, uh, the figures, uh, we begin with the fact that uh, on a worldwide uh, basis, Christians are the largest faith tradition around the world, about 30%. The rate of growth uh, predicted over the next 35 or 40 years for Christians is about 35 percent. The rate of growth for the world population over that same period is also about 35 percent. So when we get to 2050, uh, the proportion uh, of the population around the world that will be Christian will be essentially the same as it is now. But the story will be very different for Muslims. Uh, the rate of growth for Muslims over the next 35 or 40 years uh, will be such that they will uh, move from their current uh, proportion of the population to become very similar to Christians, approximately 29% of the world population. There are two major reasons for that. One is that the current population of Muslims is generally younger in age and of childbearing years, and they have high rates of fertility. And so the changes that we see in, uh, uh, around the globe, uh, the predicted changes that we see around the globe uh, in religious uh, identification are in fact driven uh, very much by uh, the current age distribution of different religious groups and the expected fertility rates, predicted fertility rates in different religious groups to a smaller extent uh, switching in or out of different religious affiliations will also play a role in the changing uh, global proportions of different religious groups. 
And speaking of switching in and out, actually one of the changes that we'll see is that in absolute numbers, the proportion of people who say, the number of people who say that they have no religious identification will increase, but as a proportion of the world population, it will actually decrease slightly. For other major religious traditions, Hindus, uh, 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 for example, um, there'll probably be no change in their proportion of the world population. Among Buddhists, there is predicted to be a slight decrease uh, in their um, proportion of the world population, in part because uh, current Buddhist populations are older and less likely to have uh, uh, many children or, or keep up with, with the population growth in the coming years. One of the dominant theories about what we can expect for religion in society from social scientists has been the secularization theory. The secularization theory has predicted that with increased modernization anywhere in the world, there'll be a decrease involvement in religious, in, uh, religious involvement. Europe is seen as the classic example of this, as Europe uh, modernized uh, levels of religious involvement uh, have declined significantly. And the question has been, why has that not happened in the United States? Is the United States actually a counterexample that uh, causes us to question whether or not the secularization theory is actually incorrect? And it's taken a while, but it's become clear that actually uh, the United States is following the pattern uh, of secularization. So if you look at the uh, column uh, on your right, uh, the oldest age group, my age group, it's the highest levels of religious affiliation and the lowest levels of non-religious affiliation, which is that green uh, uh, part of the bars near the top. And as you move to the left, you actually see younger age cohorts in the United States, and you see the green uh, parts of the bars are increasing. That in the United States, uh, we see a consistent pattern uh, with a variety of different ways in, in which we measure religion that suggests that each younger age cohort has a lower level of involvement in religion consistent with what the secularization theory had predicted. It took a while, it took a little longer for us to see this in the U.S. than it, it was uh, to see it in Europe and other places, in part because in the U.S. we started with higher levels of religious involvement than in other places around the world, and the declines have been slower, smaller, but the pattern is now uh, pretty evident, and social scientists uh, think that we will continue to see it. But the pattern is not evident everywhere around the world where modernization is incurring, uh, occurring. And so the pattern is not clearly evident yet in Muslim-majority countries. It's not clearly evident uh, in India or in China. And so, uh, to some extent, the question of the secularization theory uh, is still out, uh, and, and we'll wait to see what happens. A particularly interesting example of modernization is the increase in science and scientific knowledge uh, and involvement in scientific investigations what does that mean for religion? The popular imagination is that religion and science are in conflict, uh, that you can either believe one or the other, but you can't really believe both. Um, but it turns out that when you look carefully uh, at the ways in which religion and science have related to each other over time, that conflict theory is actually too simple. And so here's a model for, from the physicist and theologian uh, Ian Barber, the late physicist and theologian Ian Barber, who taught for many years at Carleton College, in which he describes actually four different ways in which uh, religion and science might be related to each other. The conflict model is one of those models, uh, uh, but actually a kind of mutual independence is another well-regarded model. And it may be uh, that there are models uh, in which religion and science can be in dialogue with each other or can be integrated with each other. And so you see here a quote from the Dalai Lama that points to an interesting possibility uh, in his view uh, that religion and science can certainly be in dialogue and perhaps be integrated. 
So when we think about the future of religion and we kind of think about religion in terms of religious uh, identification and affiliation, that's certainly one way to think about it. But there are some other ways that we also want to think about it. And so uh, sociologists of religion have said there are different styles of involvement with religion or spirituality. Uh, and for many, many years, the dominant style was what uh, 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 Robert Wuthnow has called uh, being a religious dweller. Somebody who um, uh, is involved in established religious traditions, appreciates the authority of those traditions, finds that those traditions shape and inform their religious experiences, their religious beliefs, their devotional practices in meaningful and helpful ways. But Wuthnow has observed that actually, uh, that in addition to the pattern of being a religious dweller, there is a pattern of being a religious or spiritual seeker. And that pattern perhaps is becoming uh, more common, more popular in secularizing countries such as the United States. And religious and spiritual seekers are people who are not particularly comfortable with the established authority of established religious traditions. They uh, prefer to have more independence and autonomy in exploring uh, their own uh, religious and spiritual pathways, their own religious and spiritual beliefs and practices and experiences. And so as we think about the future of religion and our own future for religion, uh, do we think of ourselves uh, as religious dwellers uh, do we think of ourselves as religious or spiritual seekers? When people think about the future, they think uh, that there may be many futures of religion and that the future may in part, that religion may in part play a central role in the future. And I want to share with you the perspective uh, uh, that the Fetzer Institute uh, in Kalamazoo has about this. They have recently taken this initiative to help build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. And in beginning that initiative, they say this, our goal is to help catalyze and support a broad scale, spiritually grounded transformation from an ego-centered way of being grounded in separation and fear, to an all-centered way of being, grounded in oneness and love. With the result that a critical mass of persons around the world will embrace love as the guiding principle and the animating force for living in sacred relationships with self, with others, and with the natural world. As I conclude, I invite you to think about your own interest and investment in the future of religion. And as I do that, I want to invite you to consider three questions. What is it that informs and shapes and fosters your ability to experience the transcendent, to experience the sacred, to experience awe? The first question. The second question, when the winds of life come along and destroy things that are precious to you, where do you turn to help rebuild a sense of meaning, to find a foundation to rebuild meaning and hope and purpose in your life? And the third and final question I invite you to consider as you think about the future of religion is what helps you nurture the next generation to pass on uh, the importance uh, of compassion and generosity and peacemaking? I think these are three critical questions uh, that religion can help shape as, as we think about the future. There are many futures of religion. Is there one to which you wish to contribute? Thank you.